Today, we're going to take a look at Iran's proxy strategy across the Middle East, try to break that down, make it a little more understandable. I've got an opinion piece. I saw some recent comments about how Israel is doing more to protect civilian lives in Gaza than the U.S. did in Iraq and Afghanistan. I disagree. Thought it was worth getting into. Uh, the Houthis carried out an attack in the Red Sea that forced a crew to abandon ship. And then I'm going to talk about the lack of Hamas claimed attacks in recent days, which is pretty notable. It's a lot to get into, so I'm glad you're here. I'm recording this at 7 a.m. Central on Monday, February 19th, 2024. Starting out, our newest article on Substack, it's free, linked in the description below. Adam Roussel talks about Iran's proxy strategy across the Middle East. I'm really glad he covered this. I think it's important because over the last few months, the Iranian strategy has kind of been thrown in a lot of people's faces as though everybody understands it and that it's really simple and easy to grasp. It's not. It's incredibly complicated, and uh, Iran has done a pretty good job at this point, honestly, of rolling this out. It's very challenging for the United States and our allies to defend against. So what Adam talks about here is how the Iranian strategy right now is a focus on A2AD, or anti-access aerial denial, which in plain terms means making it very hard or impossible for a country like the United States to operate in any specific area. So it's kind of a perfect strategy for a dispersed network of groups uh, with varying capabilities, but by and large, less military capabilities than, say, the United States. So the goal here through this A2AD strategy isn't to defeat the United States military, but to deny us the opportunity or the ability to operate in a given region, in this case, the broader Middle East. So you can kind of see how the occasional drone, rocket, or missile launch could accomplish that goal, right? Because it's not about destroying and killing all U.S. forces in the region. It's just kind of defeating our will to be there in the first place. So Adam's article here really focuses in on the major players in Iran's proxy game. Shouldn't be a big surprise here. We're talking about Hezbollah in Lebanon, a variety of Shiite militia groups across Iraq and Syria, and then, of course, the Yemen-based Houthis. He talks about how Shia Iran has been able to capitalize on sectarian divisions across the Middle East that have really been exasperated by foreign intervention, wars, uh, civil wars, and economic instability. And with this focus on A2AD, Iran has, to, to achieve that, have exported these low-cost drones and missile systems to their allies that could be used to strike a whole range of targets from scattered launch points all across the region. So the concern here with this Iranian strategy, is that in the event of a broader escalation, Iran, through their proxies, has the ability to simultaneously strike U.S. military assets, diplomatic headquarters, and foreign investments, such as energy extraction, essentially everything could be hit at once. We could, the United States could intercept some of those munitions, uh, but not all, and certainly not if this continues for days, weeks, or even months. Now, this is not a perfect strategy being rolled out by Iran. It's very challenging for the U.S. to counter it, but their loose control over some of these groups means that Iran has put themselves at risk of being pulled into a war that they don't necessarily want. You know, we've seen this recently play out in Iraq. After the three U.S. soldiers were killed in that drone strike in Jordan, we saw one Iranian-backed Shia militia say, Kataib Hezbollah, say, we're backing off. We're moving to the defense. And then another one, Harakat Hezbollah on Ujaba said, actually, uh, we're still in this fight, and we call on all Iraqis to stand up and face the American aggressors. So you can see how, which side do we put Iran on, right? They're heavily involved with both those groups. Uh, one of them seems to be, in a sense, kind of de-escalating the situation while the other is escalating. So Again, the Iranian grand strategy in the Middle East in terms of a military perspective, very, very challenging for the United States and our allies to beat back. But at the same time, uh, Iran doesn't necessarily have total control over where this goes, which is a significant risk to their country. Now, ever since this war kicked off in Gaza, there's been a constant flow of comparisons between what we're seeing and what we've seen in the past. Uh, in some cases, it's comparing the bombing to events in World War II or Vietnam or Korea. In other cases that I'm going to get into today, it's the conduct of the forces and how a nation carries out war. Specifically, John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson, recently said, quote, we have seen them take actions, talking about Israel, sometimes actions that I'm not even sure our own military would take in terms of informing civilian populations ahead of operations where to go, where not to go. I disagree, by and large, with this statement. I Now, it's apples to oranges across the board here. 
right? The United States and Iraq and Afghanistan is a, it's a different time, different technology, different purpose for being there, uh, different distance away from home, different cultures. Everything is different between these wars in a lot of ways. So it's very challenging to compare one to the other. But I, in terms of how we went about trying to protect civilian lives, I feel like I can dial in there a little bit to provide a little context. So I spent a little bit of time in Afghanistan, uh, 19 months total, over two combat deployments between 2010 and then 2012 with the 101st Airborne Division. Especially in 2010, that was in a pretty kinetic area, uh, Kandahar Province. Uh, Zari district where we it was near daily firefights with the Taliban so there was a lot of engagements a lot of dropping bombs a lot of firing artillery a lot of uh, direct fire firefights my job as a fire support officer was to coordinate those big strikes coordinate artillery mortars airstrikes and gunship runs uh, on enemy locations when we were engaged in in some way shape or form so I watched this play out very firsthand and our generally like our our standard was zero civilian casualties. We did not always accomplish that, unfortunately. And the U.S. military is far from perfect throughout our history, especially over the last twenty years in the global war on terror. But we went to extreme lengths to try to minimize civilian casualties. So there are a couple of pieces I wanted to point to here uh, as examples. And again, this is one man's perspective. However, through my time in the military, I've also been around a lot of folks that fought in various areas of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and these. These examples kind of hold steady across the board. So multiple times we would be getting shot at in Afghanistan, pinned down to a degree, couldn't maneuver because of the IED threat, and we had to call in air support. It might be helicopters, it might be A-10s, F-16s, anything like that, to try to destroy the Taliban fighters so we could get up and exit the area and continue our mission. Multiple occasions. We would have an A-10 coming in for a gun run so our forces that were pinned down could get up and maneuver. And as they came in on their final approach, they would call down and say, hey, we just saw two kids in the backyard of that building that you can't see from where you're located. And they would abort. They would not carry out that mission. That meant that me and our fellow U.S. soldiers continued, continued to be pinned down and had to find another way to exit that area without losing any of our friendly soldiers. Uh, because of a couple kids in the back that we couldn't see in the first place, which is the right decision. And I'm gl every single time it happened, in the moment it's frustrating because you want this threat to be to be over. But looking back, and especially uh, just moments after those fights ended, you're happy that took place because you you don't want that innocent blood on your hands. Uh, in other cases, you know, talking about getting civilians to evacuate areas ahead of an operation, we by and large didn't do that as a U.S. military. There are examples. Things like Fallujah in Iraq or, or Marja in Afghanistan, where a large-scale operation was coming and U.S. forces spent time, dropped pamphlets, made announcements for all civilians to exit the area because we're coming. And it's going to be very kinetic when we move in. But by and large, that wasn't a strategy uh, utilized by the United States. We were, we were fighting a counterinsurgency. We were trying to get the civilians on our side to tell us where the enemy fighters were and to push them out. It didn't do a lot of good to move the civilians out of their homes for an, you know, an unknown period of time while we went to war in their streets. Again, it's not a perfect example, and in a lot of cases, the civilians fled some of these areas that where there was a lot of fighting on their own. Um, but again, just kind of talking to some of the differences here. By and large, the United States did not evacuate entire cities before we moved in, uh, just kind of counter to what we were trying to do. And I, I can't tell you how many times, in fact, one of the arguments that our soldiers would have, that I would have uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, was that we were so strict about when we could drop bombs and when we could fire artillery that it was putting our own soldiers' lives at risk over and over and over again. So, you know, the idea that we would drop a building because there was one Taliban fighter in there and his entire family, like that, that was acceptable collateral damage, it may have been at some time for certain organizations and certain targets, that was never the case for us. Again, just speaking for one person's experience, kind of extrapolate that out to a lot of friends, colleagues, and mentors that served in the same theaters. Zero collateral damage was the expectation. And any time a civilian was caught in the crossfire or accidentally killed or wounded, there, there was a significant investigation that went on. Again, personal experiences, I know that that might vary, but I don't know that what I'm seeing play out in Gaza is a direct reflection of how we fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Very different theaters, different enemies, uh, different missions, different reasons for being there. But I don't think I could confidently say, as uh, John Kirby did here, that the Israeli military is going to links above and beyond what the U.S. military did in our previous conflicts. Then turning down to the Houthis in the Red Sea, uh, the Houthis put out a statement saying that their naval forces, with the help of God Almighty, carried out a military operation targeting a British ship in the Gulf of Aden, Rubimar, which I'm, Rubimar, there we go, that sounds about right. They say with a number of appropriate naval missiles resulting in uh, the ship being seriously damaged, causing it to stop completely, uh, and is now at risk in sinking in the Gulf of Aden, and they say that they were able to make sure that the ship's crew exited safely. More on that in a second. I think the Houthis are taking responsibility uh, for something that uh, they didn't do there. Additionally, they say that they were able to shoot down an American MQ-9 Reaper drone uh, with an air defense missile that they say was in the process of carrying out operations inside of Yemen. Haven't heard anything from the United States on that last part. It, it has happened in the past. A, a Reaper has been shot down within the last year around Yemen. We'll wait for confirmation on that, uh, but that would be a, a strange claim if the Houthis don't end up having some sort of proof. We'll wait for U.S. Central Command to speak to that here in the coming days. Now, in terms of the ship that they did target, that Ruby Mar that I got now, uh, the United Kingdom Maritime Trade Operations uh, organization said that this was a Belize flagged and Lebanese op or a UK registered Belize flagged and Lebanese operated cargo ship. Uh, they say that military authorities report the crew have abandoned the vessel, vessel at anchor, and all crew are safe. Military authorities remain on scene to provide assistance. That's what I was saying earlier when the Houthis said they they permitted the crew to evacuate safely. I think it was the U.S. and other allied militaries in the region that went to the ship after it was struck and helped to evacuate the crew and ensured their safety. I'm not sure that is uh, necessarily on the Houthis there for making sure the crew is safe. The Houthis are the one that launched missiles at the civilian vessel, putting the crew at risk in the first place. Then Central Command on February 17th said they conducted two self-defense strikes against one mobile anti-ship cruise missile and one unmanned surface vessel in Yemen. And then kind of a new development here. They say they went on later that day to conduct self-defense strikes against three mobile anti-ship cruise missiles, one unmanned underwater vessel, UUV. Don't hear a lot about those. Uh, and then one unmanned surface vessel in Yemen. They say this is the first Houthi employment of a UUV, unmanned underwater vessel, since the attacks began on October 23rd. Um, think of that more like a submarine or a torpedo is probably a good... Not, not submarine. A torpedo is the better example there. It's under the water, whereas the unmanned surface vessel is on top of the water, largely used by Ukraine, the USVs. Uh, we've seen a lot of use by Ukraine against the Russian Black Sea Fleet. UUV, uh, we've not seen a lot of use of recently, um, but essentially a torpedo of sorts would be the best way to describe that. Then turning back into Israel, uh, significant decrease in Hamas claimed attacks against Israeli forces in the last few days. You know, this is noticeable. What I can find across Hamas telegram channels is that they have claimed responsibility for one attack in the last five days. At the start of the ground operation, you're talking seven to 10 claim, seven to 15 claimed attacks every single day. And that has dropped down to one in the last five days. Now, there could be a handful of reasons for that. Uh, one, there's fewer Hamas militants today than there were at the start of the operation. Um, it's possible that their uh, communications infrastructure is severely damaged. They are still putting out notes on Telegram through their social media channels, but even the volume of their announcements. And what they're doing a lot of now is like the equivalent of retweeting on Telegram statements from Hezbollah, from the Houthis, things like that, like their allies in the region. They're re-telegramming, if that's the way to put it, reposting Telegram posts from their allies. That's taking up the bulk of their feed right now instead of organic statements from Hamas. The, the, those are just falling off entirely. Now, it's not the same from the Israeli side. If you look at the IDF channels and what they're talking about, the scope of operations, if anything, has intensified in recent days, especially with the focus in and around Khan Yunus and a kind of eyes shifting south towards Rafah. Every single day, there are multiple statements coming out from the IDF talking about the number of operations they carried out, uh, firefights they got into, rockets that were intercepted, uh, you know, drone and missile strikes against 
against Hamas militants that are trying to attack Israeli forces. It is constant. So that fighting has not slowed down in the least. And if you talk to anybody in Israel, it's the same thing. The fighting is still very, very intense. But it's noticeable that all of the announcements at this point, for the most part, are coming from Israel. Very, very little coming from Hamas. Again, read to that, read into that as you will, um, but it's a, a noticeable change. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack linked in the description below. We talked about the article that came out earlier today, kind of diving into Iran's proxy strategy across the Middle East. That one and a bunch of others are all free. Again, linked down below if interested. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.